Hello, and welcome to the Chicago Humanities Festival and today's program. Alicia Garza on the purpose of power. My name is Monica George, and on behalf of the Doris Conant Endowment for Programs on Women and Culture, I am proud to be here and to support this program. You can learn more about upcoming events at chicagohumanities.org. All digital events at CHF have closed captioning, which can be activated through YouTube. Thank you to our captioner. This program is presented in partnership with 826SHY, a nonprofit creative writing, tutoring, and publishing center dedicated to amplifying the voices of Chicago youth. And all of this week's programs are also presented with the support of Fifth Third Bank. Please help me welcome Adrian Marie Brown and Alicia Garza. Hi. Hey, I'm so excited to be here in this conversation with you, Alicia. Um, I have a ton of questions. I read this book and I was like, I get, I get to actually talk to the person who wrote this incredible, timely, necessary text. And there's a few things I want to offer gratitude to you first before I jump into the questions. Um, one is thank you for writing something that has so much breadth and permission for people to be themselves in movement, to really show up as themselves mm -hmm. in movement. Um, two is thank you for living a hell of a life and learning these lessons. Um, somehow you made it like quick and easy to read, but these are deep and hard lessons and you didn't, you didn't shortchange us on the depth as you got this all in there. Um, thank you for making the book feel accessible. You really selected like the juiciest bits for us to learn from. And with each place I was like, oh, I could dive 20,000 feet in. Um, and thank you for letting us see your mama's incredible love and the blessing of her lessons in your life. Mm -hmm. So just thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for the book. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think the first thing I wanna ask is just, you've been writing this book for I think three years. So how does it actually feel to have the book in the world and to be doing this whirlwind pandemic style book tour about it? <laughs> well, hello to everybody at Chicago Humanities and thanks so much for having this conversation. Adrian, I'm so glad to be here with you. And I think literally maybe a couple months ago, we were texting back and forth and I was saying, yes. I can't even imagine this moment. And yes. um, I still feel like I'm living in a dream, honestly. Mm. You're right, this book took three years to write. I almost didn't finish it. Um, mm. My mom passed away in the middle of writing this book. And, you know, I guess what I would say is that death reorganizes you in a yeah. different way. And um, it really clarifies what's important. And before my mom passed away, when she learned that I got a book deal, she was asking me every day about when the book was coming out and how the draft was going. So much so that I would be like, please don't ask about it. <laughs> You're like, I feel supported. <laughs> yeah, because it's not, going, it's not going as fast as you think it's going. It's not an yeah. essay, right? It's like, okay. this thing okay. is literally like birthing a child. And yeah. um, there were lots of contractions and there were many hours of labor. <laughs> Yes. But yeah. I can say that, um, you know, when I, when she passed away and I was kind of like looking at the rubble, right? I saw this yeah. book and I heard her voice being like, when are you going to finish the book? <laughs> and so it was one of the first things that I picked mm -hmm. up and I finished it and I finished it for her and I finished it for us. It needed to be out in the world and yep. there was no excuse to lag on it anymore. And I'm glad that I powered through it. And when I got it in my hands, girl, there was real tears. There was real shock. There was real yeah. like, oh my God, panic. This is going to be out in the world. I, I, will see it. I, I'll <laughs> it back, you know, all the things, mm -hmm. right? All the things. Mm -hmm. And I guess what's warming my heart right now is I'm getting all these messages from people who mm -hmm. have read it or they're listening to the audio book, which yeah. I got to narrate myself, which was also yeah. So they're like, I got you in my ears and I'm standing in line waiting to vote. Um, yes. And that is so humbling to me. Um, and everything you said about the accessibility, sharing my mom, like all of those things are the things that I wanted to do with this book. So thank you for affirming yeah. it. And thank you yeah. for reading it. And thank you for holding yeah. this conversation. Oh, I was geeked. I was like, oh, 
like, you know, I've been waiting for the book. I think a lot of us have been like, okay, we're ready. We saw the cover, we're ready. Like let's double dutch with this content. And I, I have a lot of different places that I wanna go. As I was reading the book, I was like note taking furiously and um, really feeling the uh, graciousness, right? I felt like you were writing with a lot of grace. You know, there was a lot of places where you could have gone you could have gone off, you could have gone up, you could have gone real low, whatever. And you were just like, let me graciously bring you the wisdom of this. And that feels like the black feminist tradition in practice. And so I loved how you spoke about consuming the work of black feminists and how it shaped and changed you. And I wonder how does it feel to now be one of the black feminists who is shaping the next generation of change makers? You know, honestly, when you said that, I just got goosebumps and I had to take mm -hmm. a deep breath. I was like, oh, is that yeah. a real thing? That's really <laughs> happening. Um, I'm honored. Honestly, mm -hmm. I'm honored. If, if that's a place that's being offered to me, I will take it um, mm -hmm. because Black feminism saved my life, literally yeah. and truly. And I talk in the book about how the first time that I had a Black teacher was when I went to college. And yeah. um, my first black teachers were black queer women who yeah. were steeped in a black feminist tradition and also um, pushed it, pushed it hard and was like, yeah, this was that, but you know what? There was some things that we didn't do right here. Right. Um, and I'm appreciative of the rigor. I'm appreciative of the black feminists who I read, who are also my friends now um, and teachers and mentors in a different way. Yes. And really grateful for that level of scientific, like scalpel worthy, right? Yes. <laughs> Carving out of um, what is our place? What is our role? Um, what is our contribution? And what can it be? What's getting in the way? And also, you know, what are we cat? What are we catapulting forward? So if, if I get a seat at that table, that's a table that I would love to sit at. <laughs> yes, I mean, it's interesting because I'll just say like your seat is so confirmed. You know, I think there's very few living black feminists who are like, I'm also in the National you know, Black History Museum. I'm not I also here, I'm also there. Like, I can't think of the last time I looked somewhere that Black Lives Matter was not present. Mm -hmm. um, so in, it's sort of like you're one of the first viral black feminists, you know, like where it's like you're getting your coins at the moment you're doing that work, you know? So I love that. Um, I also love the ways you really kept it 100, which is, you know, one of the things I'm like, that's what we come to you for. It's like, you're gonna keep it 100. Yes. And a few of the moments that stood out to me was when you're talking about being in DC with your ex and you were like, I'm gonna sit out here smoking and you were just like having this moment, it just felt so deeply humanizing where I'm like, you're giving us so much, you didn't have to, and yet it's so important for us to be able to connect and relate. And then the frustration with those who are trying to take your work, <laughs> you know, literally take your work while you're sitting here. And um, I wanted to ask you about the actual practice of the honesty. How did you learn to be that unflinchingly honest both in, in your words in real life and, and on the page? How'd you do that? Um, I think it has everything to do with how dishonestly we live. Um, mm. You know, my mom was brutally honest about a lot of things mm -hmm. and she was age appropriate. You know what I'm saying? Like she never gave mm -hmm. me more than I could. It's not that I couldn't handle it, but more than I could like comprehend but yeah. she's always super clear and um, kind at the same time. So, you know, yeah. if my mom told you, you, you did something wrong, you did something wrong because yeah. she didn't fill space with a lot of words. Um, right. But I, I can tell you that some of the things that my mom would talk to me about were all the secrets that folks kept and mm -hmm. never mm -hmm. talked about all of the ways mm -hmm. in which, um, you know, our families didn't show up the way they needed to, all of the ways in which we didn't fight for each other, all of the ways in which we made mistakes but didn't name them. And my yeah. mom was very plain about things like that because she wanted me to do better and be better. Yeah. And she was obsessed with that, right? She was yeah. like, okay, I have this little black girl child who's gonna grow up into you know, a black adult, whatever mm -hmm. gender she gonna be, right? But what I know of her now is that, um, this world is not safe for her. So I need to tell the truth about what is going on. 
And sometimes it would feel like my mom was being extreme, right? And so I talk in the book about how she would like run these self-defense drills with me when I was younger. Yes. And I'm so appreciative of it now, right? Yes. But at the time I was like, I really just wanna go ride my bike. Why are we doing all this? Yeah. And um, it wasn't too, it wasn't too honest, actually. It was mm -hmm. an interesting entry point for how to see yourself as someone to fight for. And I think kind of catapulting forward into this moment, I mean, I say in the book that movements are messy and yeah. I've experienced this so many times. And now um, most of the time I have like a Zen around it because I have, <laughs> um, I have perspective and yeah. I also have history. And so I can see that this isn't the worst thing to ever happen to somebody, right? right. And I, right. I can accept, right, that um, we're deeply human and we're all trying to do superhuman things as deeply human people. And that fundamentally we're trying to build this world and live this world that doesn't exist. So of course things are gonna be messy. Yep. And um, there's still lies that we're telling each other about um, who we are and who we can be and why we're not the things that we could be. And yeah. I wanted to bust that open because yeah. it's what gets in the way of us being really free, like really, really free. And, you know, I, I talk in the book about some of the secrets that we keep. Um, mm -hmm. I talk about the fact that, you know, I can go into a room and we can be talking liberation, but I can also know that what happens in your house is not liberation. Yeah. And that deeply bothers me because yes. that means that we are chaining ourselves. We are not free. And I want us to be so badly. So I, I tried to make sure in this book that it wasn't a tell all, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, that would be volumes, um, like Encyclopedia <laughs> Britannica type volumes, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And you wouldn't be missing a volume. It would be all the things. Like, yeah. Everything. Yeah. Um, but those are things I'm going to take with me to my grave because they're, uh -huh. they're ours, right? Yeah. Um, but the things that I wanted to kind of share was the things that I felt like were patterns and not specific to this movement, but right. they were generalized to all the times when we come together to accomplish something big and we fail yeah. each other and we fail yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So I wanted to offer it as a motivation to not be afraid of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I just wrote a piece for The Root that I should share at some point. <laughs> it's been such yes. a weird week. Might as well. I mean, you've got enough things coming. <laughs> it's like, I need to share everything. <laughs> yes. But I, I'm talking about um, the documentary On the Record and sexual mm. assault and mm. Black women in the hip hop industry. And I make this point that there is so much that we are silent around, around mm -hmm. sexual assault. And that's exactly why it's able to continue right. because we haven't. Um, been honest, right, about all the messiness so that we can just lay it open. And I think Martin Luther King Jr. said something about, in a letter from a Birmingham jail, he says something about how, like, there's a boil that has to fester in the sun in order for it to heal. And I think that there are some of those things in our movements that keep us from being as powerful as we can be together. And I hope that this offering allows people to look at it with curiosity and compassion yeah. to locate ourselves in it and also recommit ourselves to being better and doing better. I like that. And I think, you know, as I was reading it, I kept feeling that tension of what it takes to do deep work, what it takes to be authentic, what it takes to be in relationships with each other. Um, even acknowledging like movements are made up of a ton of relationships and you have to be willing to get in them and they're going to be messy. Um, and one of the patterns I felt was the tension between the pace of leaderful movement and the pace of the kind of rapid response work that often feels like, you know, it definitely has been at the heart of what a lot of Black Lives Matter has, has done and has, has stepped into, but also what all Black movement has to do these days because we're constantly under attack and having to respond. So I wanted to ask you, um, what do you feel like you've learned and can offer about finding a sustainable pace inside that tension where many leaders can actually respond to these urgent conditions? Mm -hmm. I love this question. Um, 
Here's what comes to me first, like from my gut. Yeah. Um, we need more people to take up the responsibility for this movement. Um, uh -huh. Because as long as we um, idolize it and symbolize it mm -hmm. and, you know, give it all of these accolades, but we don't fight for it, then yeah. it forces our people to fight for each other and ourselves and you with not enough resources, support, infrastructure, any of those things. Yeah. And I've been thinking about this a lot in the last couple of days because um, it feels like the world is moving at a rapid pace all around me. And for these last two weeks, I've actually felt really slow. Yes. And maybe some of it is pandemic. Maybe some of it is just, you know, whatever. I mean, my days have been packed from like 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. So it's not slow, but I have felt slow. And this past um, week, you know, as I was wrapping up my week, I got a visit at my house from the FBI. Um, uh -huh. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but essentially yeah. they were doing a like duty to warn visit. And yeah. they found my name on a list in a house yes. man who was, you know, not doing things he was supposed to be doing alongside yeah. other people's names, Patrice's name, um, yeah. you know, and other folks. And, yeah. um, you know, it was so interesting because I was getting all these texts, right? Like, sending you love. Are you okay? And I appreciate yeah. those in a deep way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you better believe, <laughs> you better believe that I have known and seen this moment since 2016 right. and yet we still don't have the infrastructure where every single person who has ever put a black lives matter sign in your window every single person who's ever said black lives matter or had a conversation about it we actually don't have the infrastructure to defend each other and right. so what i wanted right was um someone else to make the call right sure mm -hmm. i could have like started a whole thing I could have like gone into overdrive and gotten people all hyped up, but I, you know, honestly, I, I really wanted, um, I really wanted people to go into overdrive when they're hearing it. And I know yeah. people have been hearing it all over the place. And yet yeah. I love the sending you love and the, right. you know, hope you're good questions, but um, this is our fight. This right. is our fight. And um, what is our response, right? When right. our people are being threatened when our people um, are, are, are having plots developed against them? Like, what is our yeah. response? And I, mm. and I plead us to think about this because too often, and I say this in the book, you know, I've been all over the world uh, yeah. in relationship to this movement. I've met with activists and communities everywhere. And every place I've gone, people will say things like, I love your movement. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. I wish you luck. And I'm like, what? That's not how this works. That's not right. how this works. That's right. not how this works. It has to be yours. It has right. to be yours. It has to be the thing that um, brings out that instinct in you when right. anyone who is attached or connected to it is is even even somebody thinks about harming them. You have to yeah. get that that um upset inside you the same way I feel right when people who yes. I see love are being wronged like yes. that needs to spread in a deep way and That's the right. consequence of it not right is yeah. how we have this administration it's how we have this president it's how we've looked away from his white supremacist tendencies for mm -hmm. not just four years but literally decades decades. Right? decades and the only thing that will stop it is if we say no more Right. Not good luck with your movement, not I love it from afar, right? But this is ours, this is mine, and I will not allow you ever, ever, ever to interrupt it. That's what this moment is calling for. And that's what we need to shift from um, leaderful, <laughs> I'm sorry, shifting from like rapid response to leaderful, yeah. and also shifting from um, um, passive observer, right? Yeah to active um, defender, yes. to active defender. Like we need that deeply. Yeah. And co-creator, right? Yeah. Um, I love that. And I think, you know, part of what you're speaking to is also rooted in the exhaustion people are feeling, right? There's so much that like, good, y'all, you know what that, and I felt like so much of your text 
was giving people a like, yeah, we are going to be tired. This is hard work. It's actually exhausting. And we're not going to win every single thing in that moment, right? There's going to be losses. There's going to be stuff along the way. And I, I actually appreciated that one of the first organizing stories you told in there was of a campaign that was a loss and that you learned so much from that loss. And that is part of what has then contributed to the wins you've, you've had since then. Um, so with the stakes so high right now, the stakes, including your life, Patrice's life, lives that we care about, where we don't want to see the repeat of the civil rights movement, we don't want to see the repeat of losing the leaders that are precious to us and that we absolutely need. But then the stakes are also, we're losing people all the time, every day. There's these devastating losses. How do you keep your curiosity to learn um, and to actually learn from these lessons at the forefront of your grief and your anger at these losses that have really devastating material impacts? Like, how do you hold on to that curiosity, strengthen the muscle of it? Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. Um, the curiosity comes from a drive to win uh -huh. and to keep winning. And I always sense that in the loss, there is some piece of an answer for the win. Yeah. And, you know, in the example that you talked about that I discuss in the book, I wanted to start off with a campaign that didn't succeed because yeah. Honestly, there are so many of those and we don't talk about it, right? <laughs> I've had to lose a hundred times to win one time, but that win was sweet and it yeah. opened up more opportunities for more wins and we had more practice under our belts. Yeah. And at the same time, even inside of losses, there are wins. And I don't believe in like magical thinking, right? Sometimes a loss is a loss and yeah. I really wanted to name it in the book. Like, <laughs> you didn't win. <laughs> yeah. 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 we did everything and we did not win and I have a whole assessment of why yeah but there were victories and those victories continue to play out today so for example yes. um the community of Bayview Hunters Point that we were organizing in yeah. um it wasn't on tourist maps like if you visited San Francisco you wouldn't be able to look at a map of San Francisco and be like oh that's Bayview Hunters Point because it's not there it's just a little <laughs> shaded hand um, now it is on the map and mm -hmm. um, another victory, you know, I was there just recently uh, with my sister, Angela Rye. She was doing an, an mm -hmm. awesome taping and we kind of went around some of the neighborhoods where I used to organize. And I was calling some of our um, members who I recruited like back in the day and they are still organizing. They are still fighting and um, winning, right? So mm -hmm. that's amazing. Um, all of these things that we were talking about then that people literally would be like, those are conspiracy theories. That's not happening. Y'all are taking this too far. Uh -huh. Actually got exposed in the last two years. And I mean, exposed, yeah. it was like, Ooh. you know, local news, but it was also statewide news. Like people mm -hmm. went to jail off of the yeah. stuff that they were doing in Bayview. And we had been saying that and fighting around it. And it took 10 years, mm -hmm. 10 years for that mm -hmm. to get exposed in such a way where someone would do something about it. That's a victory. And yeah. so I, I wanted us to see the rate and pace of change. And That's I right. also wanted people to know that I locate so much of how I understand politics, how I understand what's important, how I understand building relationships from the work that I did in that community. Mm -hmm. And I wanted us to see change as a trajectory. Like there is so mm -hmm. much of Bayview Hunters Point for me inside of Black Lives Matter. There's so much mm -hmm. of Bayview inside of the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund. I mean, it is all about knowing what it means to be with someone when they get a sense of their own power and when they get filled with their own dignity and you get to witness that. And it is, it is the best feeling in the world to see somebody self-actualize. And yes. I want us to realize that like, that is part of the plan. It's part of our progress and it's part of what it means to win. And so even when we've got losses, like going through the rubble and being like, okay, what happened here? And also there's still some stuff you're going to pick up and stick in your pocket because it has value and it's worth taking along yeah. to the next that's thing. Right. So um, that's what I wanted to convey there. And that's how I keep um, my spirit lifted. Even in times of extreme despair and grief, I can say 
unequivocally that every single time I've thought a thing can't happen, it won't happen, it'll never happen, it has happened and it hasn't been immediate. It might take 10 years, child, but you know, yes. one thing I am not is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a Capricorn, I will be correct. I'm a Capricorn. It's a time, baby. <laughs> okay. But the First lessons time. I want, yeah. okay. the lessons I want us to take from that is, um, what are we taking from this rubble that is yeah. America? Yes. Um, you know, we are living in the midst of systems that are crumbling, um, and yeah. because they're not sustainable. And yeah. there is rubble right now. There will be rubble after this election, no matter who no matter wins. What who loses mm -hmm. and what are we taking from it? This is a moment that will be um, enshrined in history books for as long as there are human beings on this planet. Right. What role are we playing? What are we taking from this and where are we taking it? That's yeah. what I wanted to inspire us to think about and to envision and dream. I love that. And I love how so much of what you were learning in Baby Hunter's Point, so much of what you exposed was this is what anti-blackness looks like in practice. This is what it looks like when it's legislated. This is what it looks like when it's subtly moving through everyone's belief system. And I really loved how you showed all the different subtle levels and then brought it into, and this is how it shows up inside of our movements. It's not outside the door. And so many stories, you know, when you talked about uh, the Latina comrade, you know, asking like, is there basically, is there enough room for us and y'all and, and the way it felt in you. And you said this line, I, I wanted to get it precisely, solidarity can never be expressed by hearing someone's pain and then turning the conversation back to yourself. Absolutely. And I got chills when I read that because I was like, make it plain. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I hear anti-Blackness and other mess, I often hear your voice mm. saying, here's what we ain't gonna do. And <laughs> I was like, oh, no, we ain't gonna do that, no. And I wanted to ask you now, because I, I'm, I'm sure it still happens all the time to you, is how do you intervene on anti-Blackness? You know, like in that moment, there was a, a freeze and response, you know, like a gather and a response. And I'm like, what do you do now? What has shifted in how you respond to anti-Blackness when it, when it occurs now? Mm. Um, if I'm being honest, I'm much more choiceful about yeah. what I address and what I don't. Yeah. And I've decided for my own sanity that um, I am really gonna invest in the places where I have relationship, but right. I don't, I can't give myself to every instance and expression of anti-blackness. Right. And I'm often called on to do it. And in a weird way, that's kind of anti-black too. It's, it's like, can you do some more labor, please? Cause yes. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I had an experience recently where, um, you know, a, a, a person who I've known for a very long time, a white person in the movement um, was, you know, trying to get me to react and respond around an attack on somebody who I'm very close to um, under the guise of like, this is racist and you should address it. And I was like, you should address it. Yeah. <laughs> you should address it. And actually in the time it's taken you to try to organize me to do it, you also could have been doing this. Um, so I think for me, Adrian, like the, the thing I want people to take from this is, yeah. you know, so often in our movement work, we do have to make choices about yes. where we invest and where we land. And I appreciate it. I actually think that we should be, um, we should have bachelor's degrees and we should also have like PhDs and you should have wow. a PhD in the thing that is your lane, right? Yeah. <laughs> like you need <laughs> yours, like the thing that you just get into and it is like where you make magic happen. Okay. But sure, you should have a bachelor's degree and the you know general understanding of the landscape yeah. But too many people try to have a PhD in everything, everything. and it's literally not. <laughs> no, and it also shows. It's like that was the like you know download PhD. Like when you get that, I can be a pastor now and marry people or whatever. You know, it's like that's, that version. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Like mm -hmm. I think that our the key to sustainability for us um, mm -hmm. is to deeply know and be connected to what is your purpose. My purpose mm. is to build. Black political power with and for and inside of Black communities, of which I am a part. 
And that is what I give all of my time to. And anything that is outside of that, I am a fellow traveler, but I may not be able to invest in it. But just know that if I play my position really well, it creates room for you to do the same. That's and I think as we move forward where, we, where there is so many things happening here, I just want to ask us, like, what is your lane and what do you do really well? And what would it take for you to get in your lane and like execute like you've never executed before? Yes. <laughs> that is what is going to help propel us forward. And um, in this book, I do, I, I, I sharpen, right? How I yeah. got to, what is my purpose? And coming back to that over and over again has been such an important exercise for me. It's allowed me to say no. It's yeah. allowed me to say yes where I needed to. It's yeah. allowed me to not burn out trying to be everything to everybody. And it's allowed me to um, stay accountable and in, in integrity. Um, yeah. When I get out of my lane, <laughs> I feel it. You know, I'm like, I actually have no business doing this. This is not what I do. I'm not good at it. And now that's I'm right. trapped in this vortex of doing something that's not in my lane. Right? That's right. <laughs> I love that. Well, and I love it too. You know, something that we share is that writing is one of the lanes or writing is part of how we move. Right. And it's been a thing I've watched. I've watched in you as I'm just like, you know, you're, you are someone who is a jack of many trades, right? Like you could do a lot of things. Well, um, you are incredible organizing, obviously you're incredible leading, you're incredible speaking, but your incredible writing, like what you're able to do on a page, what you're able to do. You know, I remember just your Facebook post and just being like, that was exactly it. That's the emotional, that's the moment and being able to land the moment as a writer. So I really love what you're saying here because it's like, how do you figure out, like, this is something that I'm actually really good at. And I love that you claim that in the book. It's like writing is a place where you feel home, where you know what to do, where it's very clear, like this is part of how I move Black liberation forward is in these pages. So no question there. I'm just like, yeah, thank, thank you. God yeah. you're writing books. I hope you write many more. I'm really grateful for this one. Um, so something else I wanted to ask you was one of the things that we share, although it looks a little differently, is having multiracial families and intimate space, intimate circles. And it's in the moment of black liberation, I actually think it creates different conditions when you have that kind of intimate relationship with non-black people, with white people. And I wanted to ask you, what have been the impacts of having that kind of non-black familial space in your, like how does that impact your organizing? How does it impact your analysis? How does it impact your futurism? You know, like when you think of Wakanda, like where do your white folks go? Like, I'm just like, I wanted to hear about it. I loved how you wrote about it. Mm -hmm. Tell me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I have spent a lot of time um, mm -hmm. being the only one in a place. Uh -huh. And I came up in a family, um, both of my biological parents are Black, um, yeah. Black American. Um, and my mom remarried when I was yeah. young. And yeah. um, that person had been in my life since I was like four years old, right? Yeah. So, um, I did have that experience, but in a different way. And yeah. I think um, it, it gets layered in a lot of ways. I mean, it is fascinating um, to be in community where your blackness is reflected back to you in a way that is not your own. That's bizarre. <laughs> yeah. So I talk in the book, right, about how I came up in a community that it was very wealthy and very white and people performed blackness and it was awkward all the time, yes. all the time. I was like, wait a minute, what is happening right now? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but I think what it means is that I, it, it forced me to get very comfortable in my own blackness. And yeah. my, I, I never had an experience of like being ashamed of being black. It was mostly like trying to navigate other people's perceptions of what it meant to be black right so I always got the like you the way you talk you know you're not are you where are you from you know, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. you know I'm born to a, a a woman who was 
born and raised in the Midwest via the South, mm -hmm. and she moved to yeah. the West Coast. That's yeah. all yeah. the things. I got it all here. going on. I got, I'm, yeah. a, I'm regional in this piece. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm all of it. I'm all of it. And then I think also, Adrian, um, I've had the pleasure and the fortune of building some deep relationships that have allowed me to understand how we are reflected in each other. Um, yeah. You know, uh, one of my closest, dearest friends, uh, who's Chicana, um, she yeah. and I talk all the time about the relationship and the gaps between our communities. And yeah. um, as a result, I know that, um, you know, I, I bristle and fight more when I feel like my folks are getting attacked and it, mm -hmm. it hits me in a different way. Again, relationship. Yes. Um, you know, my family and friends, um, my close peoples in Hawaii, right? One of my closest friends is Hawaiian, Japanese, Chinese. And I grew up with her. And so I grew up being kind of, you know, introduced and immersed into the culture that she was growing up into. And really understanding the relationship and exchange there has been very powerful. And as I've gotten older, Adrian, one of the things that I um, have really adopted is um, only building relationships that I can consider sacred. Um, I don't uh -huh. have a lot of space for um, folks who are curious but don't want to learn. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You understand where I'm going with this? Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, yeah, like there's a lot of processes I won't accompany you through, but yes. I do find it deeply important to have depth of relationship across cultures and across ethnicities, yeah. across races and across constructed categories and really yeah. deeply understand what do those, what purpose do those constructions serve? Um, That's right. right now, we are in a moment in this country where um, we are re-energizing um, uh, an, an anti-Asian sentiment that literally makes my stomach turn. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember after the election um, in, in 2016 in Oakland, I was hearing about people who you know, we're walking down the street, Asian folks walking down the street and getting eggs thrown at them through cars and people yelling Trump 2020. And in a right. place like Oakland, you have to understand that not only is that not heard of, but it's also unacceptable. Yeah. And you're really lucky you got away with that one. <laughs> because yeah. We don't play over here on right. this end of things. Yes. Um, and I feel like Chicagoans understand what I'm talking about. Chicagoans be like, we don't None play. None <laughs> of that. Not today. <laughs> what we don't do, right? Um, and I, 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 I say that because I think, you know, so many of us think about solidarity and relationships as like college catalogs, right? Oh, I have a black mm -hmm. friend, I have a Latinx friend, you know, so I know everything I need to know about, you know, being tolerant and inclusive. And it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that, that doesn't work. Um, right. if you can name how many of a person that you have in your life. <laughs> There's more work that needs to be done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good barometer. The other piece here, Adrian, <coughs> excuse me. The other piece here is that, you know, if we're not intent on building relationships of depth and substance, uh -huh. yeah. they are um, highly susceptible to breaking under pressure. Yeah. And in this moment where we are all living under a pandemic and angry about how little answers there are, um, angry about the uncertainty of it all, angry about being cooped up in the same four walls or in the same mile radius. Um, it is really easy, right? To try to find someone to blame based on their characteristics as opposed to their rules and their policy. Right. And um, this is another place where I say we're responsible for each other. And it's our responsibility in this moment to really say, we're not going backwards. We're not going to do this like exclusion acts and, you know, we're not doing camps, right? Like we've done that yeah. already and we've yeah. already seen it's a horrible idea. So let's not ever do yeah. that again. That's great. You know, you know, where I'm going with that. Yeah. Mm. I do. And I think it's so, I mean, I just can't tell you how important it feels to have a leader at your caliber holding that stance right now. 
and really making the case for multiracial organizing, really making the case for deep relationships. So it's not just, I read this book, now I know about this, or I met one black person, now I know about this, but really like, no, deep, deep and in. And I think tying to that other piece around and be willing to protect. What would it look like for you to be in a deep enough relationship that I could call on you for protection um, when I needed that? And that you would protect me even if I wasn't there, right? Um, and I think it ties into the other aspect of construct, which you brought up so beautifully. When you started speaking about imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. I felt such tenderness because I can't, you know, I, and I can't think of any other black woman leader that I've spoken to ever mm -hmm. who doesn't at some point feel that imposter syndrome. And I love how directly you tied it into patriarchy and that it really is a shaping that happens both at the massive societal level and at the interpersonal level. So this had two questions and you can go towards either one, but one was, can you foresee a time when movement workers won't need to experience imposter syndrome? Like when that won't be like a part of the fire that you go through as you're becoming a, a leader. Um, and the other question and sort of other direction is, do you see masculinity shifting as it queers? Because mm -hmm. um, we're in like these deep queer communities full of all kinds of masculine queer folks. I'm like, can we actually reclaim and, and shift how masculinity gets held so that it's not a patriarchal imposter syndrome producing affair? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can see a time when movement workers don't have to experience imposter syndrome, but it mm -hmm. requires lots of work, societal yeah. work, interpersonal work, personal work. Um, and masculinity shifting as it queers. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I'm um, struggling with the shifts. I'm struggling <laughs> with the shifts. Me too. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if it's just like yeah. election time or what, but I, you know, I was on a thread of girlfriends today um, Cause you know, we talk about everything. I think we're literally mm -hmm. our like, uh, <laughs> we're our saviors in this yes. really weird time. And yeah. you know, the last couple of weeks has been filled with like PR stunts from the Trump campaign around uh -huh. talking to black men. Um, and I, I just, you know, I was like on this thread with my girlfriends and people are like, what is going on? Why are they doing this? And I was like, you know, more yeah. dudes need to step up. I'm not saying anything else about it because what I'm not gonna do <laughs> is be the, the woman who hates men. I'm not gonna be, oh. you know, you should see the things people say, okay? Yeah. I'm not gonna be the lesbian who hates men. First of all, I'm not a lesbian. Second of all, <laughs> second of all, child. Right. <laughs> second, Justina. second of all, child. No shade to lesbians, but yeah, I am not. They're great. It's just, <laughs> you know? you something else. Yes, I mean, what are we doing? Um, but also, <laughs> again, with the spectator sport, like yes. too many dudes are shaking their heads and being like, that dude's a fool. I'm like, right. but, so you yeah. just gonna leave it up to other people to deal with? You just gonna mm -hmm. leave it up to other people to clean up this mess? Uh -huh. So um, I actually feel in a way that as masculinity is queering, there is this backlash that is really yeah. um, just making me tired. Yeah. Uh, because honestly, we don't have time for this. We don't have time for this. That's how I feel. I'm like, we don't yeah. have time. We don't have time for you to live out your um, fantasies of being a warrior. We don't have time for this. We don't have time for this. Okay. Yes. We, don't. <laughs> we don't have time for this. Oh, right. If this man didn't have time for you four years ago, he really He's does not, not have not. time for you right now. That's just all there is to it. And no. anything less than like having been in your ear for the last four years is BS. And you know That's what? Cool. I'll see y'all. I'll see y'all in two weeks. Okay. That's right. Because so, you're going to need help. Yes. 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 Okay. But you know, well, Harry Tubman was like, everybody can't come. And I, everybody can't come. I've been really, you know, because people are like, Adrian, you're like all peace and love. And I'm like, yes, but not everyone is going to come on the peace and love boat. Because if you don't love me, you don't get to be on the love boat. Like this also, is Yeah. Boat. If you don't love yourself, child, I can't help exactly. you. There's, I no, can't there's no life raft I can offer you if you don't want to reach for it. So mm -hmm. you know no, 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 no. And I, I feel like it's a big part of celebrity culture, actually, is sort of being like, oh, like if you're a celebrity, you're now responsible for all the people, all the things, everything. And I wanted to thank you for speaking so directly to 
the tension of organizing and celebrity culture and like what happens in that space. And I thought it was so beautiful how you laid out platform, profile, pedestal, like you made it very clear, like these are what these things are. These are ways that they can be used to the benefit of movements. And, um, and then, you know, you've been in this period where you've been on the cover of every magazine, you've been on every television show, like you really have reached a level of celebrity that is unimaginable, I think, for a lot of people. So they're looking at you and they're like, I want you to do everything for me. I need you to do everything for me. And you've been so beautifully clarifying, like, here's what I'm going to do. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is your vision of where you go next in terms of how you're making use of this platform, this profile, these, these pedestals that you're occupying so beautifully? It's like, where do you want to take them? What do you, how do you want to use them? Mm. You know, it's funny because um, we've had an incredible year and certainly in these last few months, it has felt, I mean, I'm tired of seeing my own face sometimes. But you slay, you always look like a fashion model. I'm just like, yay, Alicia, that's a great look. I love this hair. I love these glasses. I love this look, like no, the clothes. Thanks. I mean, you've been committed to fabulousness since way before all this stuff happened. So. Yes. <laughs> um, but I can tell you, honestly, um, what I find really fascinating is that celebrities don't see us as celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> So there's that. Um, like, they're, yeah, they're like, I don't know who you are. Um, and also they'll be like, Black Lives Matter. And so, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's fine. It's actually good. Um, it's good to stay grounded in that way. Yes. Um, I'm really proud of my sister Patrice, who is like breaking into this space to create content that like really matters. I'm for yeah. it hundred um, percent. You know, and I'm hoping that more of us break into that space to do just that. Yeah. And at the same time, um, I see a huge opportunity right now. And yeah. some of it is, you know, I love the fact that so many people with large platforms are getting politicized and there needs to be a hub for that because otherwise yeah. we can go in the wrong direction. Yes. Some of us um, have been maybe spending the last six months watching YouTube videos, and then we emerge with theories that, um... <laughs> yeah, so I want to encourage us to not go down the YouTube rabbit hole and instead join yeah. up with a movement, organizations yeah. of people who are working together to achieve a goal that brings all of us along. Um, and that's not sexy work and it's not flashy work and it's not the kind of work that you get to like, declare, you know, all your greatest aspirations around all the time, yeah. but it's the work that gets things done. That's and right. for me, I see an opportunity for us to not just let this election year go by and then um, let Hollywood and everything else go back to the way it was. Um, we can never go back to the way things were. And I love the fact that all of these people are using their platforms for politics and not just products. And frankly, you know, um, when you get it right, child, I'm like, I'm with you a hundred percent. I'll That's buy right. all your stuff. If you say in the things I feel like you should be saying, right. otherwise, you know, I'm not going to do it. So yeah. that's one thing. Um, but we also need, we need entertainers. We need, um, Hollywood as a part of our movement. And I was thinking about this, this last week because, um, you know, Mr. Belafonte has taught us so much about what it means to be a movement worker in your lane. Yeah. In your lane. So have you ever yeah. noticed like Mr. B, Mr. B was like out here, like getting planes for people like Paul Robeson. Like, I feel like I, I read this story about Paul Robeson and how Mr. B, um, when he was young, like helped Paul Robeson, who was basically being attacked um, yeah. under the McCarthyism Act. And Paul Robeson was a beautiful, beautiful artist, composer, black, brilliant genius. Mm -hmm. And here come Mr. Belafonte, like, I got you, I got you. And mm -hmm. what he did not do was be like, I have a new initiative. <laughs> Right. He was like, let me roll up my sleeves and, and put my um, platform and my power to use. And I, right. I see a lot more seeds of that right now. And I want to help grow them. I love that. I love that. And I love that so much of this is learning also how do we harness this online, offline, online, offline dance as it is changing all the time. Right. And 
I wanted to share, you wrote this, technology allows us to connect, but there's also some evidence that technology has in fact increased isolation. If we never have to be in the same physical space as the people we interact with, this can affect the value and depth of the relationships we build. And then you also spoke to how we're primarily harnessing and educating online in order to move people offline. Um, but then we're in this condition where offline is becoming less and less available, less and less safe because we are in still Trump's America. And the, the impact of those bad decisions is going to keep us in this indoor, less safe space for some time. That's so right. a question I had for you is how do we combat the isolation and the limitations of our indoor reality in this pandemic age and still keep organizing and moving our folks? Mm, connecting, connecting is yeah. so big. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting, like I'm watching my sister, Latasha Brown, you know, she'd been in probably eight states in the last eight days. Yes. And they're out here and they're masked up and they're distanced, but you know what? They're like, hey, we don't have no time to play no games. Yeah. And I love that. I think that actually this is going to be our way of life for yeah. A while or stable future. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think, I mean, I read this article in the New York Times a while ago. And basically the author was making the argument that this is this is a new 9-11 moment. So, you know, we can mm. remember when there weren't metal detectors in airports and there was no TSA. And actually, there's now a generation that never knew an airport right. before TSA, right? Just like I never knew an airport or an airplane that you could smoke in, right? right. <laughs> that was like normal for my <laughs> parents, right? I know. So thank goodness I never knew an airplane you could smoke in because that's nasty. But, um, <laughs> you know, I will say too that I think this is our way of life now. And one of the things we started doing um, at the Black Futures Lab is we, when the pandemic hit, we just started creating places for people to connect and not trying to bludgeon people with like a message. You know, we're just like, hey, do you want to watch TV together? The new season of Insecure is out and it might be nice yeah. to just like be connected. And people were like, thank God, <laughs> right? And at the end of it, we could have a conversation and be like, stay in touch with us. We're going to do more of right. these things. I think that is kind of the next part of this future. And I, I, yeah, and um, what I like about this moment, honestly, is it's made everybody abandon their avatars. I remember, That's right. you know, like I remember I would see people and they would like refer to themselves as their Twitter handles. I was like, what are we doing? What is that? <laughs> I don't understand. Like, like, but what's your name? Not, Who are yeah, you? Like your people. actual given name. But we're no, I don't, I think, you know, this pandemic has pulled back the curtains on yes. what is real on that avatar and what is not, child. We've seen people show up in all kinds of ways. Everybody being asked to be on Zoom and can you do 8 million Zoom meetings? People just stopped caring. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm in my pajamas. I've worn the same thing for like 10 days. Don't judge me. And people are like, yeah. I'm not because I'm doing the same. And now I'm obsessed with baking sourdough bread from scratch. <laughs> Yeah. So in some ways, I'm, I'm interested to see how we adapt um, yeah. in this period. And I'm hoping that actually social media and our usage of it shifts too. Me um, too. Yeah. And I'm hoping that these platforms get held accountable, but that's a whole other conversation for a whole other talk. Because Another book. So I have one last question for you. Um, and it's, this book is so personal, but also so practical. Um, there's so much in it that's like, I can use this immediately. Mm -hmm. And it felt really timely for how we can build power, um, how we can come together when we come apart, when we've fallen apart. Um, and regardless of the election results, it feels like this is going to be a book that people can turn to, to figure out how to move their community. So I wanted to tap into your visionary brilliance here about the possibilities. So can you give us an idea of what our first steps should be? Um, once Biden is elected um, and wins, or if they try to steal the election, because those are the two options that I see. <laughs> so what's the yeah. next step? Two options, but one future, which is we yes. have to keep building this movement. And so mm -hmm. I would say um, the core things I would offer here are movements are about addition and multiplication and not subtraction and division. Um, and we cannot afford to keep 
breaking down into smaller and smaller silos around yeah. um, things that are not widely and deeply felt. Um, yeah. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Also, if movements are about how we come together when we fall apart, what is the character that we want this movement to have? What do we want it to feel mm -hmm. like? What do we want it to taste like? What do we want it to like smell like, right? Like what is the shape and form, but also what's the, what's the juju that we're putting up in there? Um, mm -hmm. So that's the second thing. And then the last thing that I would say here is, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot and I know you've been thinking forever about this, um, which is what are our futures, what are our futures calling for from us in the now? And if movements are about people who are trying to live in real time, that which does not exist, then yeah. what is it that we can build in this moment so that we can continue to sustain the world that we long for, even though it's yeah. like just still growing like a little embryo, right? Yes. Um, in the book, I say that we have to be able to provide hospice care to the things that are dying. And hospice has a fundamental principle, right? About not interrupting the death process. Um, right. There is no drugs to be given. There are no antibiotics, child. There is no resuscitation. It is like, let yeah. this go and let it be on its journey. That's and there are a lot of things that we need to let be on its journey. Mm. But then also, what are we providing prenatal care for? What are we growing? Mm. What are we investing in? What are we um, nurturing right now um, that will, you know, become its own, that will become its own thing in its own dynamic? I love that. <laughs> I love this book. I love the work. You know, so much of my work has been small is all and everything big we want is out of these small things and i felt like you showed us like here's the small things here's a small relationship here's the door knocking here i mean like you really showed the way it's such a way and i just want to thank you for pouring so much love into this book because it really feels like we have to love ourselves we have to love each other and we have to love our future and it feels like this book is a love note to the future everyone go read it download it listen to it share it with a friend, buy it for a young person. This is the book they've been waiting for. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, uh, you. thank you for this gift. And I hope you continue touring forever in all the ways and enjoying it. Thanks thank Chicago you. Humanities Festival.